Rejection? It's good for you. That's what my dad would say. And it is a pretty basic thing. Like on my third week in the second grade, my parents patiently listened to me rant about my teacher and various schoolyard injustices. And when I'd merely pause for breath, Papa would say, okay, good. Now start from the beginning. Tell me all that stuff again, but in our language. Bisaya na po, Jay, and now in Bisayan, Jay. That wasn't rejection on his part or a disregard for my excitement and zest for telling a story. He was asking me to edit, revise. He was inviting me to be more, maybe in the hope, in the hope that I'd turn around one day and expect more. Language and culture, expectations and disappointment all whirl and weave their good and gray in and around young life. My younger self reached out for more to belong to, finding value in myself by discovering more people of my own. When I turned 11, my mom and dad and I had just moved to San Diego. I was in the sixth grade in a new school. I had a bright and mature outlook on life, I thought. I was nervous, curious, and serious. At times, with secret purpose, I was trying to be everybody's favorite clown. I would try to get laughs with some verbal slapstick. I would change my voice unpredictably, play with language, emphasize the wrong words like knock knock, who is there? I was weird but confident in a way that made other people feel a little uncomfortable. But I never got tired of watching people, comparing interactions, behaviors, and I made friends quietly, cautiously. One such friend I found out was half Filipino. Better than that, her mother was from Leyte, an island in the same central region as my family. I lunged, what? No way, my dad's mom, my grandma is from there. That means you and I, we both speak Visayan, right? No, she said too calmly and a little too readily. I only speak English. Maybe I understood stuff when I was little, but not anymore. My dad's American. <laughs> she smiled in a way that seemed kind, but also in a way that could have been rehearsed sophistication. Some kind of advanced level sneer, <laughs> like wide-eyed high school level snotty. My over-the-top reaction was too much. It made me vulnerable. And I was back where I started, talking to no one. That rejection was like a mouthful of bitter melon. That crispy, pushy vegetable has shown up to ruin childhood mealtimes everywhere across Southeast Asia. <laughs> Truly, it's the most bitter thing you'll ever taste. But you need it. It's good for you. Once any morsel of it touches your tongue, there's no escape. Your mood will sharpen as you wince, each molecule, molecule of you bracing and fortifying a path of protective fluids from your taste buds to your intestines. Not to be put off so easily, I kept searching for somebody who was like me, who spoke the language I spoke at home, outside of home. There were plenty Tagalog-speaking Filipinos all over town, happily, openly, criticizing me for not speaking fluent Tagalog. In my mind, I screamed, we're a collection of tribes. We're not just one thing. <laughs> my need to be specific about language and culture came simply from the fact that I knew where I was from. I was proud to know it, but had no real peers to stand with me, proof of me. So when I'd go to the store with my parents and I'd hear someone speaking in what sounded remotely like Bisayan, not Tagalog, my ears would perk up. I'd rush to the aisle where the voices were, casually hop out from behind the cheese puffs with a wink and a smile. I didn't get many casual responses back, however. In the beginning, at home, it's, it's not clear which language could be called my first language. In all probability, it was a fusion of Bisayan and American English. Nalibang nabakadai? Did you poo poo today, little girl? Uy, bahu animo dai, uy? 
You so smelly, little girl. Shortly after swaddling clothes phase, my parents fell on hard times. They decided that they'd be able to work more hours to earn and build a better life in which to raise me if they were free of me temporarily. So my mom traveled away from the US with me to her mother's home in Cebu, told me she'd be right back, and didn't dare look back for a year. In that time, I celebrated my third birthday there. I miraculously survived the deadly breakbone dengue fever there. I lived and spoke and fought illness with my people. So it was that language and the notion of home, identity, and family were ground up and sprinkled onto my convalescing, dreaming toddler body. <clears throat> In the second grade, my dad insisted that whatever conversation I had at home would be spoken in Bisayan. This was, the direct, this was in direct defiance to my first grade teacher's recommendation that I try to learn and focus on only one language so as not to confuse the girl. My parents smiled at Mrs. Prevatali in a non-committal way that said, oh yes, yes, you are very smart. You are the teacher. As I grew older, I considered quitting my search for other groups to belong to, but how could I when that would mean I was quitting on being a more whole version of myself, a more cohesive blend of my two worlds? So I searched on. I learned to be a little less overt and a little more modest in communicating and broadcasting my alikeness with other Filipinos. I would employ the soft, nonverbal cues, encouraging glances I'd often seen my parents use. Bisaya ka? <laughs> After the sixth grade, I stopped looking so closely for anyone else who was even a little bit like me. I learned other languages, made my peace with obnoxious vegetables. <laughs> I learned to relax in knowing that the people like me, the people I am looking for, don't have to be from Cebu, speak Bisayan, or even know themselves completely. But they do have to love old movies. I mean, really love them, not ironically or academically. <laughs> they have to be willing to break into song with me anywhere, including but not limited to grocery outlets and trolley stops. And most importantly, they have to be able to take rejection, because it's good for you. Amy Apple.